بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد عليه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد my brothers and sisters in Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته now from here I can't really see you but I know which seats are empty because the silver pole or the, 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 you know, the silver part of the seat is shining in my face for those that are not sitting in a chair. So I can tell where people are and where they aren't. I'd like to begin by firstly correcting our brother Urwa, mashallah. I've graduated two years ago from my master's degree. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Um, our topic today is a very interesting topic. It's a topic that affects every single one of us as our two brothers just finished highlighting and pointing out to us. We begin by firstly looking at how our family itself can revolve around the deen and how sometimes we fail to actually achieve that in our homes. I want us all to transport back a few years this was while I was still a student in Medina, I was teaching in one of the masajid in Montreal. And while I was teaching there, and I know many of you are like, why are all the speakers coming from Montreal now? C'est parce que nous parlons français, et on peut écrire, lire, parler dans des langues uh, comme le français, English, Al-Arabiya, Bahasa Malayu, et, uh, and we can communicate in various different languages for those of you who don't speak French. Sorry. So we see here that the element of, of the family that is lacking in terms of salah, and that's really what we want to focus on, begins before salah even takes place. It begins by making wudu inside of your home. And I want to transport us all back, like we mentioned, to a few years ago when I was still a student in Medina. And I was teaching at a masjid th during the summer. And I had approximately 60 to 63 students in my class. And these students were all children. And one day, during the summer, one of the parents comes up to me, the father, and he says, Can you teach my son how to make wudu? I then ask him, Who's your son? He says, So and so. I said, but he's like 12 years old, 13 years old. He goes, yeah, but I want him to learn how to make wudu properly. And I was like, what do you mean make wudu properly? Like, are you not making wudu properly? So if that's the case, you need to learn how to make wudu, not your son. First of all, as the father, you need to be the one to learn how to make wudu. He's like, no, but you know, you're mashallah, you're the teacher, you know this stuff, you teach some Quran, etc. So just teach him how to make wudu properly. And I told him, I said, listen, uncle or brother, you have how many children? He goes, I have three children. I go, you have a wife and three children in your house. And you have the whole day to divide your schedule, to spend time with your family however you want. I have 62 or 63 students in my class and I have exactly two hours to listen to all of their lesson give them a new lesson for tomorrow, teach them a dua or teach them a hadith and then listen to the one that they learned the previous day, etc, etc, etc. And I have two hours to do that. I said, I spend a maximum of two minutes with your child one-on-one -on -one every single day. If that even happens, two minutes. I'm like, there's no time. I just can't do that. He goes, no, but why don't you teach them how to make wudu? And that brings me to my point. My point here, my brothers and sisters, is that many of us fail to recognize the fact that our children learn from us when we don't even need to speak. When we're making wudu inside of our home, and we live in Canada, so our sink is inside the bathroom, which is inside one room that has the toilet bowl, it has the sink, it has the bathtub, and it might have whatever other luxurious things that we have, or it might have absolutely nothing in there. But the point is the bathroom where we make wudu typically, that sink is inside a room and there's a door. And that door is usually closed when we are making wudu as parents. And when our children want to learn how to make wudu, 
or they're just learning how to be like me and you because they look up to us as role models, they don't see us making wudu. So the parent who says, my child doesn't know how to make wudu, the problem is not with the child, and the problem is not that the parent doesn't know how to properly make wudu. The problem is, we just didn't open the door. We just don't let our children see us performing acts of ibadah that lead towards the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's it. It's so simple. We, and now we transition from the wudu aspect of our household. You know, what's stopping us from opening the door or going to make wudu in the kitchen so our children can actually see us performing wudu and how we're supposed to do it? You know, sometimes we go to events and we're making wudu in the public bathroom and people come to us and they're like, Oh, mashallah, Shaykh, can you show us how to, how to make wudu properly? And I asked them, so you mean for the past 40, 50, 60 years of your life, you've never been making wudu properly and you never had the interest to go and learn how to make wudu properly? Which means if you're not making wudu properly and you know you're not making wudu properly, then how are you even praying your prayers? And so it's not a problem with the way we're making wudu. The problem is how we teach our children. You know the saying, monkey see, monkey do? Children see, children do. Children are not monkeys, we know that, okay? The evolution theory doesn't apply in Islam, we don't believe that we came from apes, etc. But what we're trying to say here is that children see their parents doing things and children do it. Do you remember the time that your child first said that bad word inside of your house? It was probably three or four seconds after the mother or the father said that bad word inside the house as well. They lost their cool, they lost, you know, they got frustrated, they were irritated with their children, and they said, what are you doing? You're dumb. And the child goes, ha, ah, you're dumb. Mama, you're dumb. Baba, you're dumb. And everyone is like, no, no, don't say that, don't say that. No, no, don't say it, it's a bad word. Mama, you're dumb. Mama, you're dumb. Why? Because you said that word in front of them. You gave them permission to use that word. As a parent, they see you doing it, they do it as well. And so when it comes to wudu, that applies. Now when it comes to salah, the exact same thing applies. How many of us as adults, as parents, as you know, most particularly the men of the household, go to the masjid to pray our salah regularly, and while we're at the masjid, we pray our sunnah as well, and then we come home as though we could have either gone for a coffee at Tim Hortons, we could have went to the grocery store, we could have gone for a business meeting, we could have gone to the masjid and prayed, we could have sat in the car and recited Qur'an, we may have given some sadaqah, but our children have no idea what we did while we were gone. Because while we were gone from the home, nothing educational took place from the aspect or from the, from the angle of the person who was gone. But the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is to do what? It's to go, the men go to the masjid, they pray their prayer in jama'ah, in congregation, in the masjid, and when they're done their, their compulsory prayer, if they pray their sunnah in the masjid, they come home and they pray nafil prayers at their house. If they don't pray the sunnah in the masjid, they come home and they pray their sunnah prayer inside of the house. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ tells us, لا تجعلوا بيوتكم قبورا Don't render your homes as though it is a cemetery. Do we pray in the cemetery? Do we go to the cemetery five times a day to pray? I know in some countries, some cultures, some people do. But that's not part of our deen. We don't visit the cemetery five times a day. We visit the masjid five times a day. We come to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the masjid, not in the cemetery. So the Prophet ﷺ says, don't make your home like the cemetery. Why? Because the cemetery is a place that you don't go to to pray regularly. The masjid is. Make your home as though it's busy with salah. Now how do we do that as a family? We spoke about wudu and how we should let the family members see that we're making wudu. Don't you think the same thing applies when it comes to salah? Yeah, of course it does. But what we make mistakes in is that we all have, or 90% of us as Muslims, we have these nice clocks in our homes. 
And as soon as it's time for salah, you'll hear the clock, the watch, the cell phone, the iPad, the desktop, and the laptop, all of them going at the same time. Like there's five or six masjids in your neighborhood. You know that digitalized adhan that you hear. And it's like coming from everywhere. It's nice. It makes you feel like you're in Medina, like you're sitting in, fr in, in front of, you know, uh, Masjid Qiblatayn, for example, and you hear the Adhan coming from all different places, and in the distance you hear the Adhan from Masjid al-Nabawi. It sounds nice. But what we make a mistake in doing is that our children don't copy the clock. Our children don't walk around like, I'm an iPad today. Our children want to walk around and say, you know what, Baba dresses nicely, I want to dress like Baba. Mama's got the most beautiful hijabs, I want to wear the most beautiful hijabs, right? They want to be just like their parents. So when they see their parents, it's time for salah. The father, before he leaves his home to go to the masjid, what does he do? It's time for salah. What do we do when it's time for salah? Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa Allah. Hayya ala salat. Shouldn't we be calling our family members to salah? Hayya ala salat. Let's go. It's time to pray. Even if someone lives all alone, you're a university student, you live all alone, get in the middle of your home, the place where everyone's going to hear you, the humans as well as the angels. There are other creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the jinn, that engage in salah. Those that believe, call them. When you enter your home, the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu is to do what? You enter your home, you enter with your right foot, what do you say? Honey, I'm home. Where's dinner? No. You enter your home. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The single brothers and sisters that are not in the matrimonial thing are like, well, we don't have anyone to say salam to. Yes, you do. Your home is filled with either goodness or evil. The evil that's there when you say salam, <laughs> they run. They leave. The good that are there, they're happy, they respond to your salam. Similarly, when you call the adhan inside of your home, do you know what shaitan does when shaitan hears the adhan? Hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, why don't we understand it? The Prophet ﷺ teaches us when the adhan is called, what does shaitan do? Does anyone know? Does anyone know? He goes away? He goes away doing what? He's mad, he's upset, yes, but he's going away doing what? Does anyone know? Raise your hand if you know. What is he doing? Hey? Farting? What did he say? Hiding? Before he hides, he's running. What is he doing while he's running? He's hearing, what is he doing? I gave you the answer. Shaitan is breaking wind. He's flatulating. In Canadian terms, il pet. He's farting. Literally. The Prophet ﷺ tells us he's breaking wind. Why? He's doing it so loud out of disgust for what we're about to do. We're going to pray. He doesn't like it. He doesn't want to hear the adhan. So he's relieving himself as loud as he can. So he doesn't hear, his, he doesn't hear the adhan that you're calling. Isn't that what we want to do when we complain and we say, you know what, our families are suffering. They come to the imam. They say, oh, you know what, there must be black magic. Someone gave nazar to my family member, right? Those of us that know Urdu, right? Ain for those that speak Arabic. Evil eye for those that speak English. We complain about this stuff and yet we don't realize there's ways and methods to protect ourselves. And we don't understand that when we step away from the simple things that we learned when we were children, 
those simple things are actually set in our deen to protect us. When you call the adhan, the shaitan runs and makes as much noise as he can doing what we said he does simply because he doesn't want you to hear or he doesn't want to hear himself you calling the adhan. So parents, get in the middle of your home, the place where the Nintendos, the Xboxes, the Playstations are being played. It's time for salah and everyone's hearing the Medina style adhan echoing from here and from there, from left and from right. And what are we doing? The kids are playing, they don't even hear the six or seven different adhans that are going off in the digital sense. And you come in the middle and you say, my sons, my daughters, I'm not going to force you, it's time for salah, I will, I will now call the adhan and you begin Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar and you call the adhan they hear it they learn a lesson don't expect them when you go home today and you try this don't expect them to change like that you need to work hard now we all need to work really hard on our family members it is not going to be easy. Work doesn't begin at 9 o'clock when we get to the office. Work begins at 5 o'clock when we get home from the office. And subhanAllah, we're seeing crazy trends of things. I live in Mississauga. The other day I was, I was behind this school bus that was not a school bus. It was a school bus that goes to school and picks up students, but it doesn't take students from their homes to school and from school back to home. It takes them from the school to the taekwondo, to the karate, to the jujitsu, to all these different things. It takes them from the school to their tutorship, to where they're going to get, you know, tutoring in math, etc., English, French, sciences. You know, it's taking them from one school to another school. Either they're going to learn some sort of physical activity or they're going to do some extra math, science, etc. Why? Because the parents, mom and dad, both work. And mom and dad, because they make so much money, and I don't know why they need to both work in order to make so much money, in order to pay for those activities. If one of them worked and the other one stayed home, the children can go from school back home. And the mother can be there, or the father can be there from work. When he's done, he comes home, and they can educate the children. The mother and the father can teach the math and the science and the English. If we're educated enough to work at Deloitte and to work for the government and to work in all these beautiful places, public sector, private sector, etc., shouldn't we be educated enough to teach our children math, science, French, biology, etc., that we've already passed up until grade 12 at least? Of course. Of course. We can all do it. We just think that we don't have time to do it. So we work harder to pay for more services that are going to take up the life of our children occupy three hours of their evening because mama and baba are not there yet they're busy at work so let's pay for them to go to taekwondo and after taekwondo they go straight to the masjid the bus takes them from there to the masjid so they can go for quran class they come home and they have this beautiful 1.5 million dollar house and what do they do every single member of that house only sees the house when they're asleep what's the point of the house you may as well live in a shoebox Seriously, I was picked up this morning and, you know, being driven to the airport and it was a Palestinian brother that was driving me and he was saying, you know, we might have luxury cars and luxury houses, but the happiness is still in those people whose houses are under their feet that have crumbled to pieces and they're playing on top of their house that they no longer have to live in. He goes, those people are more happy than you and I. And he's from Palestine and he's telling me that their homes have crumbled and they're still happier, they're, they enjoy life, they get an apple, they cherish the apple. We give an apple to our child, they say, I don't want that. And they throw it in the garbage at lunchtime because they don't want to eat it. And every single week you're going and doing groceries and you're buying two dozen apples because you have two children and they go to work and they go to school and every single day you send them to school, you give each one of them an apple, they take that apple and they throw it in the garbage because they're not cool kids at school if they, don't, if they eat an apple. Yeah, that's actually happening. Ask the children. Ask your children, they'll tell you. Ask the children. I ask them. I see them doing it. Ask them. They throw goodness from our hard-earned money in the garbage. Save all that apple money, save all the fruit money, and put it towards something else. Stay home. Buy less for them. And so when it comes to salah in the home, 
begin by calling the adhan in a common area of the house. Call them to salah. Now let's look at another aspect of salah. You know, subhanAllah, many of us, we complain when our children become a certain age. And we say, you know, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is that by the age of 10, they should be praying. So we wait until, okay, my daughter is just about to turn five, four, three, two, one. Okay, now she's 10 years old. Beti, yeah, binti, you now have to pray. Why? Oh, you're 10 years old, you have to pray now. Haram alayk. What's wrong with you? You have to pray. You're 10 years old now. Don't you know the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Oh, and by the way, you need to wear your hijab as well. Oh, and by the way, you need to do this, you need to do that, you have to fast, you have to... The whole list. What is a child thinking? I'm running out of here. I'm leaving. No way I'm going to live this type of life. So strict, so hard. My life was nice and enjoyable and pleasurable and I got iPads and I got iPhones and I got this and I got that and I enjoyed myself and all of a sudden I need to live. I can't go out anymore. I have to cover myself. I need to wear an abaya and you know, I need to grow a beard and I need to do this and I need to do that and I have to pray. And, and then we come to the imam and we say, Sheikh, can you make a dua for me? Why? Please make a dua that Allah guides my children. No dua is technically needed from the imam. You as the parent, first of all, start making the dua. You as the parent, first of all, start being patient with teaching your children one step at a time. Okay, you've reached a certain age. By the way, my daughter, I made a mistake. I should have been teaching you that for you know, all these past few years, you're supposed to be learning how to pray. And when I pray and you see me pray, sometimes you can come and join in with me and pray. Or my son, the same thing, the exact same thing. It doesn't, you know, I'm just using son and daughter as examples. But what we fail to do is teach our children the core elements of our deen until we think, oh, now they're ready for it. Now they're mature. And we let our children run wild. We just let them do whatever they want to do. Yeah, they can play. They can have fun. They don't have to pray. So don't force them to pray. But let them see you praying because at least you're, you're establishing a foundation for them when they get older and they go through a hardship in life. They will think, you know what, when my father, when my mother was going through a hardship in life, they would turn to Allah in sujood and everything would be okay. Seek help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your salah. Be patient, be patient with Allah. And how do we do that? We do that by seeking that assistance from Allah in our salah. Akrabu ma yakunul abdu. The closest that one of us as a worshipper of Allah will be to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is when? Not when we're standing in front of the Kaaba. Not when we're fasting during the day of Ramadan. Not when we're praying speed to Hajjud. Right? Right? No, not when we're doing that. Or Taraweeh, even worse. Right? That's not the time that we're closest to Allah. What does the Prophet ﷺ tell us? The closest that a servant is to Allah, to his Lord, is when? Wahuwa Sajid. When that person, that worshipper, is making sujood. When we put our head to Allah, to the ground, we are the closest to Allah. In salah. Or outside of salah. You need something, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your salah. Or in dua, outside of salah. Just make a sujood. Right now, you need something. You, you asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Ya Allah, forgive me. Simply go and make sajda anywhere. Make sajda, as long as it's clean and it's not in the bathroom in the places that are not permissible, make sajda to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask Him for forgiveness, ask Him for assistance, ask Him to guide us and ask Him for whatever you want. And thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One last thing I wanted to touch upon is that for those of us, uh, there, was, there was something I wanted to mention that Sheikh Naveed mentioned, so I'm not going to go over it, which is protecting your salah by praying the sunnah and the nawafil. Those are protection layers that you have upon you. 
But one thing that I'm going to mention is for those of us that really are concerned about our, our families and those of us that really want our children to pray and those of us that really want to be an example for our children, why is it that those from amongst us that want all those things are not getting up in the middle of the night to pray extra prayers when we don't technically have to? When we're covered up and that beautiful blanket is over us, it's filled with down, it's soft and fluffy, and the pillow is under our heads, and two pillows are there, and one pillow is under your arm, and another pillow is behind your back, and you're all in this fluffy playground. You're enjoying your sleep, you're in la la land. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls out to you in the Quran. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim Ya Ayyuhal Muzzammil Oh you who's wrapped up and comfortable in your bed Qumil Layla Illa Qalila Get up for a portion of the night Stand in Salah نِصْفَهُ أَوِ انْقُصْ مِنْهُ قَلِيلًا أَوْ زِدْ عَلَيْهِ وَرَتِّلِ الْقُرْآنَ تَرْتِيلًا Recite the Qur'an in the middle of the night. Stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask Him for forgiveness. Pray for your family members. And make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you live and you die upon iman. And fill your nights as much as you can. Even if it's one minute that you sit up in your bed and you make dua to Allah for one minute. And you go back to sleep and then get up for fajr. Do it. And tomorrow it will be two minutes. And the day after it will be three minutes. And the day after it will be four minutes. And etc, etc, etc. And that's what we need to do in order to bring salah into our homes. It's simple really. It's really, really simple. Just remember the concept. Children see, children do. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all ease. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us a deeper understanding of this deen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easy for our, ourselves and our children and family members to pray their salah regularly. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us the understanding of why we pray our salah, which will be for another topic. Wa jazakumullahu khayran wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Assalamu alaikum.